Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I'm your host, Deacon Isaac Longworth, and a couple of days ago, I was with the other seminarians from my house watching a movie called Nefarious. Nefarious is a new movie. It's out in theaters right now, and it's about a man who claims to be possessed by a demon and his interactions with a lawyer while he's on death row. Now, just to say it off the bat, I don't really like horror movies. I really don't like being scared. I don't like the feeling of it. And I find that in a lot of Hollywood horror movies, um, especially about demons, there's really bad theology. Like they don't really do their research well on how demons work or, or what the church does to help people in this situation. And in fact, most horror movies glorify evil. But this movie, Nefarious, I got to say, it was different. It was actually really, really good. We all enjoyed it. Um, and this movie, Nefarious, it captured the realism of demonic possession. It really got into what it is like for a demon to take control of someone in that way. And it helped get into the mind of the demonic. And I really enjoyed this movie because the dialogue was incredible. It had really good theology. You could tell that the producers had done a really good job of figuring out exactly what Christianity teaches about demons, and they just did such a good job of it. And I love the fact that Nefarious, uh, as a movie, used a fictional story. This didn't actually happen, um, but they use a fictional story to tell really profound truths. Truths like demons are real. Truths like demons use sin to tempt and enslave us. And I won't spoil how the movie goes, but I really encourage you to go and watch Nefarious. It's out in theaters right now. I really enjoyed it and I can highly recommend it to you. And the reason I start with that is because the saint that I want to talk to you about today was very familiar with how demons worked because he himself was an exorcist. He spent much of his time in priestly ministry battling with evil spirits in order to bring freedom to those who were possessed. And this saint is named St. Francis Borgia. Now, Francis was born in the year 1510 in Valencia, Spain. He had two brothers and four sisters, and his family was incredibly rich and powerful. If you know anything about history, you'll know at that time that the Borgias were uh, a huge political force in the country of Italy. They had many secular and religious connections, and they had an incredibly fascinating family history, to put it lightly. Um, Francis himself was the great-grandson of King Ferdinand of Aragon on one side, and he also was the great-grandson of Pope Alexander VI. Now, you might be hearing that and saying to yourself, wait a minute, if he's the grandson of the Pope, that means that the Pope at some point must have had children. And you would be right in wondering how exactly this happened because Popes aren't supposed to have children. And uh, Pope Alexander VI was a interesting Pope, to put it very lightly. He had many illicit children, uh, one of whom brought about the family line where Francis was born into. And so uh, if you ever think that the church is crazy or that it's seeing some wild times right now, don't worry. There's always been something worse that's happened in history, something uh, more insane, like, for instance, the Pope having a whole bunch of illicit children. But Francis came about because of some of these relationships, and Francis's grandfather was assassinated by a political enemy, meaning that uh, Francis's grandmother, who was left behind as a widow, became a nun, along with her daughter, who was Francis's aunt. Now, this is important because Francis's grandmother and his aunt were both two holy women, and they worked really hard as nuns to bring the practice of the faith back into their dysfunctional family. The Borgias were dysfunctional in so many different ways, as you can probably see, um, popes having illicit children, assassinations, all this political intrigue. But these two holy women worked hard to bring Jesus and the practice of the Catholic faith back into the family. And through their influence, little Francis learned from them all about God and the reality of the spiritual world. That the world really is more than what we can see. That the spiritual world is real. That angels and demons and God himself, these are all real things, even though he couldn't see them. That it wasn't a make-believe fairy tale that we just go along with to pretend, but that it's all true. And that 
We are in the middle of a battle, a spiritual battle that is raging for our very souls. And Francis was able to learn from them that our life is short, that as human beings, we don't have a whole lot of time here on earth. And so we need to focus on living for God, resisting the temptations of the evil one, of the evil spirits that want to tempt us away from God and lead us to hell. And so we need to have an eternal focus, living our lives for the eternal reality because this time on earth is so fleeting. Now, this lesson hit home for Francis in a really personal way because when Francis was only 10 years old, his mother died and his father went on to marry a new woman. Together, they had 10 more children. And so now Francis was living in this reality of a blended family. There was new siblings to learn how to work together to somehow build a new family. And he was faced for the first time with the reality of death. And he saw for himself how short life on earth could be. Now, when Francis was 12 years old, uh, a rebellion broke out in the territory that was governed by his family. And so for his own safety, he had to be sent away to live with his uncle. Now, his uncle was uh, the archbishop of an area, but he wasn't properly consecrated a bishop. He was basically using the title of archbishop for his own power. This is, again, just more symptoms of the crazy family politics that the Borgias had. They would, um, you know, treat church positions as if they were just ways to get power and riches over other people, ways to build up the family presence, the family power, almost like uh, the mafia or something like this. And so... uh, Francis was sent to go and live with this uncle and without the saintly example of his grandmother and aunt, Francis began to fall away from his faith. He was living now in the court of his uncle who by all means did not follow his Catholic faith very well. He was basically using his fake title as archbishop to get power for himself. And so in his court, uh, the courtiers went through the motions of being Catholic, but they were much more focused on getting wealth and power. And Francis just got sucked into all that. He lost sight of the spiritual world. He became very focused on earthly things and he kind of put his faith on the back burner. He forgot about living for heaven and began living almost exclusively for the glories that this world had to offer. He became very successful in court because of this. He was actually um, really good at his job. He kept earning more titles and wealth for himself. Eventually, he worked his way up to working for the empress herself, an extremely prestigious position. And Francis was intelligent. He was handsome. He was really good with people. He was a composer of music. And so everyone loved Francis. He just kept rising in power, doing exactly what his Borgia family expected of him which is to make the family proud and to keep cementing their power in that area. He lived a life of luxury, of gluttony. He was extremely wealthy. He was proud of himself. He was selfish, honestly, just living a noble life in court. Now, when he was 19 years old, Francis met and married a woman named Eleanor, and the two of them had eight children together. Again, just keeping on this rich and easy life. But when he was 29 years old, Francis had something happened to him that changed his view on life. Because the empress who he was serving died quite suddenly, and part of Francis's job was to um, take charge of transporting her body to the funeral site, which was a two-week journey away. Now, as you can imagine, a two-week journey back in that day when they didn't know how to prepare bodies the way we do nowadays, um, she didn't look exactly the same as when she left. And when the coffin was opened, Francis looked down at the formerly beautiful empress's body, and he saw that her beautiful face had decayed, that she had um, started to decompose, and it was a horrible sight to see. And when he looked at this decayed face, Francis was very viscerally reminded that all earthly glory, all earthly beauty, it passes away so quickly, that death comes for all of us. And he was forced to reflect Am I ready for my death? Am I living for the eternal reality that comes after death? And so he came back from that funeral, a changed man. Like Francis was like, I want to be serious about my faith now. I don't want to live for the fleeting glory that this life has to offer. I want to live for heaven. And so he began to pray again. He began to fight the temptations of the devils instead of just going along with whatever his own selfishness wanted. He realized that God was the Lord of his life, not himself. 
He fasted from food to make up for years of luxury and gluttony. One of the things he would even do is when he had to um, take medication for different health problems he had, instead of swallowing it quickly, like most people would do because it tastes disgusting, he would chew his medication, the pills, on purpose in order to train his body to make up for all those years of gluttony and eating rich food to fill himself with earthly pleasure. And when his wife died, Francis felt called by God to become a priest with the society of Jesus, with the Jesuits. These years of prayer and, and growing deeper in his faith had risen this vocation in him. And so he went to the society of Jesus and asked to join. And they told him, well, wait until your children are provided for. You still have all these kids. Make sure that someone is able to provide for them, that you leave enough money for them, and then you can join us. But for now, you can become a Jesuit privately and live your noble life in court until the time is right. And so Francis did that. He still worked as a nobleman. He studied theology. And when he was 41 years old, his children were able to be provided for. He passed on his wealth and his title to his son and he was ordained a priest. Now, right from the bat, Father Francis made a mark on the people who saw him. Because at the very first Mass that he preached a homily at, he preached such an incredible sermon that the congregation was amazed. And within the context of this sermon, he showed, he manifested the gift of tongues in that people who didn't speak his dialect of Spanish were listening to his homily and understood him perfectly. So right from the start, people in the pews were thinking, who is this new priest and what is he going to do? What is God going to do in his life? Well, for the first few years of his priesthood, he worked as a parish priest and he loved this role. His people loved him. He was an amazing preacher. Uh, he said an incredibly beautiful and reverent mass um, when he would lift the host up into the air, the consecrated host during the consecration, his hands would tremble. The people noticed that his whole body would shake because of the awesomeness that he recognized in holding God in his hands. He would visit the hospitals and he would pray with the sick. Uh, he had a real gift for healing people. And so people would come to him with their illnesses, with their injuries. One of my favorite examples of this is uh, a fellow brother priest who had his two front teeth knocked out during an accident. And so because of the loss of his teeth, he couldn't preach properly. He couldn't speak properly. And so he came to Father Francis. Father Francis picked up his teeth, put them into his mouth, put them back into his gums. And when he pulled his hand away, his teeth were firmly back in place as if they had never been knocked out. So Francis had a real gift for healing. He also would go about doing spiritual healings visiting personally the houses of people who had been away from the faith and he would invite them back sharing about how he had been away from the faith for so long and he would invite them back to church invite them back to prayer and many people were convinced by him and they came back to church now francis also served as an exorcist father francis helped people who were troubled or possessed by evil spirits to be able to find freedom in jesus now, the Catholic Church has always taught that demons are real. I mentioned that at the beginning when I was talking about the movie Nefarious, which does a really good job of showing this reality. Demons are real. The scriptures are full of examples, stories of them interacting with human beings. Uh, they are fallen angels who hate humans. They want to destroy us, and they want to destroy us by leading us away from God. And the demons have a very specific plan to get you into that state, to get you into their control. And it starts with temptation. Now, temptation is something that all of us experience. I know I have, you probably have as well, in which a demon suggests a sin to you. This thought, this idea comes into your mind to do something that you know is wrong. And if you choose to do that thing, especially if that uh, sin is serious, if it's grave, that's something called a mortal sin. A mortal sin is when you choose to do something that is very gravely wrong uh, and you are freely choosing it. You're not being forced to do it, even though you know that it's seriously wrong. When this happens, when you commit a mortal sin, you kill the life of God in your soul. That's what it's called mortal. It's called mortal because it's like a mortal wound in your soul. And a person in a state of mortal sin 
has given rights to themselves to demons, that you've entered into a relationship with them. You've opened a door for them, which allows them then to have more and more influence and interference in your life. And if a person has done this, if they've surrendered themselves to demons in this way, it's possible for demons to start oppressing that person. That might be through um, dark nightmares, through um, episodes of depression or panic, um, even sometimes physical attacks um, that happen because the demons now have you in their control. You've left God, you've sinned, you've, you've turned away from the Lord, and now you belong to the kingdom of darkness. You belong to the evil one. And if this continues, if the person doesn't seek to fight off these attacks, if they don't turn back to Jesus and seek his healing, well, then a demon can lead you into a state of being obsessed with them. There's always a constant presence of evil thoughts in a person's mind in this state. The person obsesses over the demonic. They're fascinated by things that are dark and evil. They're, they're driven by it. And they're even tempted to despair because more and more of themselves is being lost in surrender to the demonic forces that are moving in their life. Now, the final state that doesn't happen very often, but does happen sometimes, is called a state of possession. And this is where a demon has some degree of control over the body of the person. Now, the demon never has control over the soul of a person. That soul belongs always to the person himself. And so even a person who is possessed still has freedom of will. They still have the freedom to choose, though it has been seriously, seriously wounded because of how much in a deep relationship they are with the demon. But they are never so far gone that they can't still choose God. Even a possessed person can be saved, can be turned away, and can find freedom because God is infinitely more powerful than even the strongest demon. Even all the demons put together are not even close to the power of God. Now, in a state of possession, a person uh, is so physically, emotionally, and spiritually broken down by going through these other stages, temptation, uh, oppression, obsession, um, that these demonic spirits are able to seize control over that person's actions. And exorcists will look for signs of possession by seeing if there's something more than human going on. Some of these signs could be uh, superhuman strength, where the demon is using the physical body of the person to do things that they would not be able to do on any physical level. Another example of a sign that exorcists will look for to see if someone is possessed is if the victim is able to speak a language that they don't know, or if they are have some kind of hatred or aversion to holy objects like holy water or a crucifix, or if the victim is able to know events that could not be known just on a human level, but the demon himself through his intelligence is able to convey. Now the church in all of this, when it comes to possession, believes that this is a real thing, that this can actually happen to people. And so the church still has a way for exorcisms to be done today. Exorcisms are uh, special prayers that the church does in order to free people from demons through the ministry of priests. Now, Jesus in his own life, he did exorcisms himself. He delivered people who were possessed by demons. And throughout the history of the church, Jesus has empowered Catholics to do battle with demonic powers and bring real freedom to those who have been enslaved by evil spirits. And Father Francis Borgia was an exorcist who did this himself. Now, most of his exorcisms were done in secret, like most exorcisms are, but there are still many stories that describe what his battles with the evil one looked like. There's one story where he was called to a possessed man who several other exorcists and even bishops had tried to free, but with no success. And so Father Francis came into the room where the possessed man was. He prayed the church's right of exorcism over him. These special prayers that the church gives to free and deliver those who are under demonic possession. And when Father Francis laid his hands on the possessed man's head, he said the words of Jesus. He said, in my name, they shall cast out demons. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. Again, the power of Jesus is so much greater than the demons. The demons are in utter fear and terror 
of the powerful name of Jesus. And so the demon was forced to leave because of these prayers. And the other people in the room were amazed that Father Francis had been able to deliver this man who no one else had been able to deliver. And Father Francis, to avoid being prideful, he just joked with them and said, well, two of a trade never agree. I did the devil's will for years when I was away from the faith. And so it's no surprise that for now he has to obey my will, right? So he just made a joke like, you know what? I'm not that special. This is all the power of Jesus. And the devil had to listen to me only because I listened to him for so many years. But the person still has to be free in an exorcism. This is very important. The person actually has to want to be freed or else the exorcism won't work. Even St. Francis couldn't force it on a person because as long as the person was resistant, the demons still would maintain their control. Once Father Francis was called to a dying man, a famous sinner who hated God his whole life and he wanted nothing to do with a priest. Now Francis came to him anyways because his family wanted him to be saved and Francis came into the room with a crucifix in his hand and he pleaded with the man saying to him, look at this crucifix, see how much your soul cost Jesus. See what depths his love has descended to receive you into his arms and into his glory, even now, if you will repent. He offered this man confession, which is a sacrament that is more powerful than even an exorcism, because an exorcism isn't a sacrament, but confession is, it releases grace to break any relationship that you have with evil because it removes the sin that first opened the door of your heart to them. But despite all of his pleading, the possessed man just screamed obscenities at the priest. He blasphemed God and Francis was forced to leave the room. Now he eventually returned and tried all over again, but with the same results, the man refused to allow himself to be freed. And so Francis told him, since you refuse the gift of the blood of Jesus that was shed for your salvation, depart now into eternal damnation. And the man died, unrepentant, still bound to his demonic masters right to the very end. And so this just goes to show that we are always free to come back to God, but we are also always free to reject God. Some of the people who Francis was called to to pray for They wanted to be free, and so they were. But this man, he wanted to remain in that state of possession, and so he died without receiving the saving grace of confession. Now, during his showdowns with all these different evil spirits, Father Francis would often have to go through attacks and distractions because they wanted him to get thrown off from his work of saving souls from their their grasp. Um, They would make loud noises in the house. They would even throw furniture around. They would appear to him in terrifying and ugly forms. But despite all of these distractions, Father Francis always persevered in prayer. He refused to back down until the person who had come to him for freedom was released and the demons were forced out. Many, many people were delivered by his ministry of exorcism and they left their life of sin now being able to live in freedom for Jesus. And because of all the amazing work he was doing in the church, the Pope asked Francis to stop being a pastor and to come serve in higher roles in the church, which Father Francis didn't want to do. He was happy to be with the people. He didn't think he was worthy and he kept avoiding it, but he couldn't hide forever. He had to be obedient to the Pope. And so eventually he was called out of parish life in order to work in various administrative offices in the church. Even within his own Jesuit community, he was called to higher and higher titles. He helped in the formation of all the new novices who were studying to become priests. He expanded the community's mission work. He was even elected to become the superior of all the Jesuits. And yet, despite all of these high titles and responsibilities he had, he remained humble. He would volunteer to do the lowest chores in the house. He would act like a servant to the brothers. He never considered himself better than anyone else. In his later years, he began to suffer incredibly from gout and stomach problems that left him almost constantly in crippling pain. And yet he never complained. He kept working hard for the church and the salvation of souls, even despite his illnesses, until one day while he was traveling in France in the cold month of February, 
he contracted pleurisy in his lungs that made it very difficult for him to breathe. So he suffered for many months in bed until eventually his condition worsened. He got a raging fever, and eventually after an eight-month illness of incredible pain, he gave one final blessing to his children and grandchildren who had gathered around his bed before he died. Now, St. Francis, there's a lot we can imitate in his life, but one thing I think we can really take away from him is the reality of the spiritual world. The fact that angels and demons are real, that demons really do want to tempt us to be sinful so that we will be enslaved to them and lose eternity with God forever. But we also need to remember, as Father Francis did, that God is real and far more powerful than any of the evil forces of hell. And in the name of Jesus, we have true power. We have true victory over evil and we are able to be set free. And so with all of that in mind, let's pray right now to St. Francis Borgia that we would become great saints just like he was. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Francis, you came from a family background that was extremely convoluted and very dysfunctional at times. But God was still able to use your experiences to make you into a great saint. So help us, no matter how complicated our own family history is, to remember that God still calls us to rise above our past traumas and to become holy. St. Francis, you had experiences with death that very powerfully reminded you of spiritual realities, of the need to live for heaven. So help us to imitate you in not relying on any earthly accomplishments or goods, on our beauty, on our riches, our relationships, our successes, even our physical health, because all of that is passing away. But St. Francis, help us like you to focus on what endures forever, which is a relationship with God. You were not afraid of demonic powers, but you fought them in order to bring people to freedom through the power of the church's prayers for exorcism. Help us to fight the lies of the evil one as soon as they appear in our life. Help us to resist temptations, to avoid any kind of occult or satanic practices, to reject any attempt of demons to build a relationship with us so that we can live in freedom for Christ. St. Francis Borgia, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.